get with us again this week. Appreciate, appreciate him coming here. <laughs> Driving through the ice. <laughs> yes, sir. Man. Get you dismissed. <coughs> Father, we thank you for this, this day again that you've given to us another day of breath. Thank you for every breath and heartbeat that you've given to us. And amazing biology, <coughs> evidence, and testimony to your intelligence and your design uh, in each one of our cells and our bodies. Thank you that you are the head of your body, the church. I pray you would just saturate your body with life today, uh, worldwide. Help our eyes, our hearts to be set on you and focused on you. Lord, would you please take this time together with every man and woman here and the children downstairs. And would you please just sow your word, your seed, and your light into each one of our hearts. Help our hearts to be receptive. Help us to have perspective. Please, Lord Jesus, please purify us and help us to be um, busy about what you want to do in our lives. That would be your life living in us and through us. Looking forward to your return, uh, anticipating the coming of the Lord. We look for you uh, to set things straight all over our, this world, Lord, and make uh, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for getting us here safely, and I pray you bless the rest of this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So, church, would you please turn to the book of Revelation? Uh, we'll be in chapters 10, 11, 12 mostly, but before we get into that, I'm going to just read a few highlight verses that I wanted to focus on. And our focus, if you're familiar with any biblical prophecy, is going to be the final week, actually the middle of the final week of Daniel's 70 week prophecies. What that means is there is still a pending seven year period of time leading up to the return of Christ. And what we're looking at today is basically right smack dab in the middle of that. There are three main significant events that will happen leading up to the return of Christ. And uh, one of these is what we're going to read about, the seventh trumpet. The other two I would also draw your attention to would be God judging Mystery Babylon the Great, and then ultimately his return in judging Antichrist, uh, the false prophet, and, the, and binding Satan, and putting him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. That's right at the end of his return. And his coming is also referred to like birth pains, contractions. So really, if you think about that last seven-year period, it's like when contractions start. And it's leading up to the birth, or the return, not the birth, but the return of Christ into this world. Sorry. And some highlight verses uh, that happened at that midpoint that I wanted to focus on, that seventh trumpet. The, the title of this is The Seventh Trumpet, The Mystery of God Fulfilled. Victory in the heavenly places for believers and for all of God's people in heaven and on earth. And the key verses that I would like you to consider uh, is in chapter 10, verse 6 and 7. Uh, verse 5, 6, and 7. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore to him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, 
when he is about to sound, the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. And remember, mysteries, we talked about that a little bit last week, well, a lot. Uh, it's God revealing uh, truth or reality according to his, his word, opening people's eyes and hearts. This last seven-year period that we're talking about is the beginning of the day of the Lord, where God will reveal himself to the world, everyone in the world, in a more open and obvious and supernatural way than he ever has before. Again, preparing and leading up into the return of Christ, where he sets up his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And some things have happened in that period of time, uh, including um, trying to grab the unbelieving world's attention in some degree to turn them to repentance to Christ. Uh, at the end of chapter 9 in Revelation, after on the heel of the seven seals being broken and the first six trumpets being sounded, which are military commands, typically speaking, we're talking about like the preparation of Christ's kingdom in a military action on earth, coming to earth as it is in heaven. It says in verse 20 of chapter 9, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and of brass and of stone and of wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders nor of their sorceries or Pharmacia, this would be uh, illicit drug use or witchcraft, nor did their immorality, nor their immorality, which was sexual immorality, nor of their thefts. So it seems, by and large, mo most of the world does not respond to the promptings um, to be ready for Christ's return. When Christ returns, he's going to do two things simultaneously. He's going to comfort his afflicted people, or his people who have been afflicted throughout history, throughout the ages, um, at the hands of this mystery Babylon figure, and also uh, of the kingdom of Antichrist that spanned throughout world history in some form or another, and that will ultimately build up to like the worst, led by the worst bad guy of all time. And mystery Babylon is sort of like a counterfeit uh, religion. On the creation moment, you saw a tower of Babel. That was uh, the people of the world united in a false religion and attempting to contact a false version of God and influencing people worldwide to unite to that endeavor. And Mystery Babylon has influenced world empires throughout history with false religion, with a false version of Christ. And also they've been a big afflictor of God's true people throughout history. In fact, murdering his saints and influence the kingdom of Antichrist throughout history. So she'll be dealt with towards the end of that seven year period, Antichrist right at the end and his whole kingdom at, when Christ returns. And here we look at the midpoint, the mystery of God being fulfilled. What's so significant that's going to happen at the midpoint here? And, and what's, the, what's the importance for us here as well? We'll get into that in just a moment. But just want you to consider that throughout Scripture, there's a clear bridge between heaven and earth. And Christ identified himself as that bridge. Remember? When he called one of his disciples, he said, You believe, I think it was Nathaniel, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree that I'm the Christ. You're going to see greater things than these. From here on out, you're going to see heaven open and uh, the angel, angels of God descending and ascending on the Son of Man. He, claimed himself to be that bridge between heaven and earth, like in Jacob's dream. Remember, he was on the run from his murderous, vengeful brother, Esau, and that's where God met him, with his head on the ground, on a rock, sleeping. I feel like I slept on a rock, by the way. My neck is all tweaked. I tried stretching it this morning, and I think I heard even more, but uh, uh, there, God revealed the gateway to heaven and the house of God to Jacob, remember? And there's this bridge, this connection between heaven and earth. Remember, Christ taught us also to pray to the Father that his kingdom will come and his, his will will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. So this, there's this transmission, this communication between heaven and earth and bringing heaven down to earth. <coughs> 
Things that occur in heaven, I just want you to consider this, things that occur in heaven, right now, today, they affect what happens on earth. We know that Christ is praying and interceding for us, for believers in the presence of God the Father, like our great high priest, who's gone on, the accepted and beloved Son of God, stands before the Father in heaven with all of us in him, and we therefore being in him, like in Noah's ark, are accepted and safe before the Father, and him praying for his will to be done in each one of our lives individually, I believe he's doing that. That affects our lives, yes? Here on earth. Of course it does. He doesn't pray for nothing. His prayers are not nothing. Uh, they always are answered because he always prays according to the will of the Father. He stands there on our behalf with his perfect person and perfect sacrifice <coughs> of his own blood. <coughs> Another cool thing is this. Believers on earth, can we affect things in heaven? Does it work both ways? It does. Why would we be praying otherwise? There are some other reflections or interactions between heaven and earth. In Sunday, adult Sunday school, we mentioned Job and the suffering that he went through. You remember, how did that all come about? Satan, along with the holy angels, what's implied in the fallen angels, appeared before the throne of God in heaven. They all assembled there. Satan still has his authority that he had originally, and he still has access to heaven, and his, his mocking of God's holy man, Job, sort of prompted God to allow the temptation and trial, the testing and the suffering and misery into his life. It affected what happened in Job's personal life. But um, all that to say is that we know that is the oldest book of the Bible, he still has access to heaven today. Uh, Jesus said to Peter, remember, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, remember? But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail when you are restored, you know, strengthen your brethren, strengthen your brethren in the faith. Other reflections, um, just consider Abraham and the promises to Abraham real quick. Remember how he said he'd multiply, among other things, his, his descendants? And he compared his descendants to be that like unto the stars in heaven, which is cool, and also, what else on earth? The sand of the sea, the seashore. So we've got this reflection of heaven and earth, even in the promises of God. And in Ephesians, uh, Paul prayed the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we would know the hope of our calling uh, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Talking about Christ, the power that he works in our lives to accomplish those prayers is according to the resurrection of Christ and his ascension to the Father. Remember, he came down, died, went even further down to the depths of hell and ascended, uh, resurrected and ascended back to the Father. A famous passage in Ephesians chapter 6. The armor of God. This shows also something that happens in this communication between heaven and earth. <coughs> and a battle, a wrestling match, if you will. A struggle that we encounter here on earth. That actually, the wrestling mat isn't here on earth. It's in heaven. It's in the heavenly places. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle... Or we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you'd be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. He says, stand firm, therefore, with your loins girded with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you'll be able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So there's exchange of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of fire back and forth from our enemy and ourselves, from heaven and on earth, and the influence he has. It's not going to stay like that forever, is my point. And that's what we're going to be focusing on, that seventh trumpet. What's going to be significantly happening? worldwide and including
including the heavenly realms. And, okay, without any further delay, let's read about how God said, let there be no delay in Revelation chapter 10. <coughs> Revelation chapter 10. I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head. And his face was like the sun, and his feet like a pillar of fire. This rainbow on his head is a calling to the throne of God itself in chapter 4 of Revelation. And there's a rainbow around God's throne, and this is a call back to the flood of Noah, of course, <laughs> and uh, his purity of light. And this, I mentioned this last time. This is a major event. He said he had in his hand a little book. He's on earth with this symbolism of the rainbow on earth connecting to God's rainbow throne. And he had in his hand a little book which was open. He placed his right hand on the sea and his left hand on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw, standing on the sea and on the land, lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and things in it, and the sea and the things in it. That's the three domains of all creation. There is no other place. God created the heavens and the earth. It's divided into those three domains. Uh, sea, land, and air, or heaven. Of course, our military is divided in the same way as well, right? Um, he is this nexus, um, kind of bridging all three domains together and swearing this dramatic oath. Roaring like a lion, he's proclaiming there's not going to be any more delay, no more waiting. Waiting for what? This is a callback to Ezekiel. Ezekiel was foretelling of the fall of Jerusalem um, and the Babylonian captivity that was coming. And there was a proverb circulating among the people of implied non-believers that basically that's never going to happen. These words are never going to come to fulfillment. And Peter mentioned it this way. Uh, people will be saying, scoffers will come in the last days, where is the promise of his coming? Remember? All things continue the way that they have since the beginning. He's not... I remember uh, a teacher growing up in grade school. I went to a Catholic church, and I was not a Catholic, but I went there. Um, and she said, when someone inquired, one of my peers inquired of her, you know, with fear a little bit, I think, of the return of the Lord, Jesus Christ, she said, well, that's not going to happen. They've been saying that since I was a child. They've been saying it. It's exactly what was quoted. She basically quoted Peter, you know? Um, And God said to Ezekiel, there's not going to be any more delay. But every word and promise that I said is going to happen, including the judgment on non-believing Israel, and not only that, but all the nations surrounding them as well. And like I said, when he comes back, he's going to bring comfort to his people and affliction to those who have afflicted his people. Those two things will happen simultaneously, and that's what this last seven year period is building up and leading towards and there's a major landmark event that happens right in the middle again it's we'll get into that in just a second this is an emphasis here that we delay no longer but in the days of the seventh angel when he's about to sound his trumpet that is the seventh trumpet that's at the midpoint of the seven year period then the mystery of god is finished as he preached to his servants the prophets this is also a ref refining moment when trial and tribulation comes for those who claim to be people of God, um, we see maybe if they're lukewarm or if they're, if we're not following the Lord completely, trouble and trial tends to have this effect on us. It makes us point our attention, our heart towards the Lord and yield to Him and look to Him and to consult Him. Um, so there's His people that this has an effect on, but also those who are not His people. It has an effect on them. We read about them at the end of the last chapter. They don't want to repent. They won't repent, it says. And, of course, the fullness of Israel will be coming at this point. Israel 
national Israel at this point will have not believed ultimately in the Messiah yet. Up until right after this point, they're going to start turning to the Messiah, Christ Jesus. Um, there will be some that will have. That's the 144,000 Jewish witnesses mentioned. They'll be prophesying for the first three and a half year period as well. As the two witnesses that we'll read about in a second, um, I think it's Enoch and Elijah. It's, uh, definitely Elijah, possibly Enoch. And then the voice which I heard from heaven, verse 8, again speaking of me and saying, Go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So it's connected to the throne because we've got God's sovereignty and control his purity and holiness, his righteousness, his fairness, okay, his justice, standing up for freedom where no one else does, what is truth and life and real and holy, he stands up. This angel with that rainbow around his head and the cloud over his head is connected to the throne. He's also got a book open in his hand, and John is told to go get that from him at that moment. We just made that oath that there be delayed no longer, that the words of God be fulfilled, the mystery of God be fulfilled in the days of the seventh angel, sounding the seventh trumpet. So I went to the angel. Imagine if you're John, going to a massive angelic creature, looking awesome like that, standing on the sea of the land and, and reaching up into heaven, making an oath, holding a book. The voice told him to take the book from him. This is like, again, a callback to Ezekiel. He ate a scroll, Ezekiel did, the word of God, that was sweet like honey in his mouth, but it made his stomach bitter after he ate it. And it was the prophecy of God's word to come. It was a bittersweet thing. So I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter. But in your mouth, it will be sweet as honey. It's just like Ezekiel. Um, I took the chapter 2 in Ezekiel. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And my mouth was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now, there, the book of Revelation isn't always like in sequential, orderly steps on a timeline. If you remember, like in Genesis 1, you have the account of creation, which is definitely chronological. But then in uh, chapters 2 and 3, it seems like a different version of the account. It sort of rewinds back, a little flashes back, and gives another more detailed account of the same account. So this sort of this looping effect as far as narration in the book of Revelation. There are some things that are clear sequence order, like seven seals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then the seven trumpets. And there are some landmarks that help us see where in that seven-year period it lands. Like the seventh trumpet is at the midpoint. Um, but here, we're kind of flashing back. After the sixth trumpet had already been played, we're actually reading about the events of the sixth, sixth, excuse me, sixth trumpet. And they coincide with the two witnesses in Jerusalem. And connected to that is one of the three woes. That's a lot of information. I'm sorry. But there are three woes that are lined up with the last three trumpets. So that one, you'll, see, you'll see the word woe here that signifies the second woe or the sixth trumpet. It was given to me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. It's sort of an assessment according to God's righteous standard of holiness whenever there's a measurement of the temple or the people therein. And of course, we all fall short of the law of God. We need the grace of God in Christ. He said, leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it's been given to the nations, and they will tread it underfoot. They will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. That so happens to be three and a half years. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Again, three years. That's the first three and a half years. So it goes actually re rewinds to the beginning of the seven-year period and really focuses in on the midpoint at the end of this chapter. There are two; these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth, referenced in Zechariah chapter four, when God called Zechariah, sorry, to prophesy uh, to Zerubbabel, which means sown in Babel, and Joshua the high priest, that they were going to be supervising the reconstruction of the temple. And they were like luminaries uh, of God. But at that point, um, also, Enoch and Elijah were standing before.
before the God of heaven and heaven, in heaven the, itself. They were the only two in history that had been caught up and into heaven and raptured up, so to speak, without dying. Remember, Elijah caught up in the fiery, uh, in a whirlwind, this fire chariot parted his way from his disciple, Elisha, and Enoch was taken from, from earth when he was walking with God and was not seen anymore. He didn't die. If anyone wants to harm these two guys, they're like bulletproof, right? Impervious. If anybody wants to hurt them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. That is to speak, they could speak a word of fire being called down from heaven like Elijah did, remember? It doesn't necessarily mean they're literally fire-breathing people, which would be kind of a cool superpower, I suppose. But um, if anyone wants to harm them, that's what's going to happen. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall according during the days of their prophecy, their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast, it's a reference to Antichrist, that comes up from the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. So the clue is that's Jerusalem itself, where Christ was crucified. Referenced as Sodom, a wicked city, right? And Egypt, a place of, of slavery, apart from Christ. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. They're presented as enemies and haters, right? They are, they are presented as immoral because they dare to share the truth of God and call people to truth and real life in Christ to repent, to change their minds. So insensitive to say that someone can be wrong. It's only insensitive if someone is wrong and you let them go on being wrong without saying anything. And I, if I do that, then I'm insensitive. Um, of course, as much as people will hear is what we're limited by in some degree. And they heard a loud voice, excuse me, verse 11, but after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they, then they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. They were resurrected on live television. They will have been, anyway. Uh, and in that hour there was great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Earlier in previous chapters, the woes are synchronized with the last three trumpets. And uh, finally, look at, oh, next to finally, penultimately, the seventh trumpet, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged. This is sort of a bit of a fast forward to the end of that seven-year period. And the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your names, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was open, and the ark of his covenant appeared in the temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. So again, you've begun to take your power, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of the Lord and of his Christ. That's the significance of the seventh trumpet, that midpoint section. That's why that angel says it's going to be delayed no longer. But what actually happens in the scenes of heaven? Almost done. Thank you. Hang in there, everybody else. I know that she's probably um, a litmus test for everybody else, I guess. But sorry. What happens 
is the delay no longer? The mystery of God is going to be completed at this point. This is a highlight. What actually happens behind the scenes leading up into this is covered in the next chapter. And I'm just going to read through it very briefly and emphasize what happens at the end uh, in verses 10 and 11. Okay? Chapter 12 is sort of like a parable. It's a it's a panorama, an epic panorama of world history that leads up into even like the com first coming of Christ. And at this point, that three and, a year, three and a half year mark in the last seven year period leading up to Christ's return. Read with me. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And on her head, a crown of 12 stars. This depicts, um, this depicts Israel in one sense. This also depicts the 12 stars, like the 12 tribes. And Joseph had a dream about his mom and dad. Remember, one of his dreams is involved the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down to him, remember? So this is an indication of Israel in one sense. In another sense, it's an indication of Mary herself, the virgin who gave birth to Christ in, in time and space. She was with child and she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns on his heads, and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems of crowns. So this is a span of world history, of world empires, the seven heads, how, how the dragon has influenced seven world empires leading up to the return of Christ. These seven heads and ten Horns indicate these ten kings that will be in power when Antichrist, before Antichrist comes to power. They'll give their power to him. They'll cede their power to him. Other passages reference that. I don't have time to get into that, but moving on. Verse 4, And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. That's where we get our picture of how many angels fell with Satan right there. Uh, we don't know how many. A third of the stars indicates his dragon took down a third of his uh, his peers or his subordinate angels if you will because he used to be the top angel um, the top holy angel I should say still retains his authority but something's going to happen here in this chapter that will be a decisive blow against the dragon on behalf of God and his people his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. This is, again, reference to how Satan tried stopping the prophecies of his own demise. In Genesis 3.15, one day a seed of the woman would crush the head of the seed of the serpent, the dragon. Serpent, um, dragon, synonymous in a sense, except... Um, ones without legs, of course, and, and wings. And he said that would happen, this descendant of the woman would crush the enemy of all mankind that got us into the mess, the world of mess, literally, that we have. He would try to stop that prophecy from happening by wiping out the Jewish people throughout world history, in one sense. Because it was through them that Christ was coming the first time. Guess what? It's to them that Christ is coming the second time as well. They're still a target prophetically because they're a gateway for Christ's return. And so he, and even with Herod trying to wipe out all the children, two years old and under, remember? To kill Christ that the Magi said that had born king of the Jews. He's a competitor to Herod who had usurped the throne. Therefore, he had no problem just wiping out little children in the town of Bethlehem to try to take care of his competition. And he was satanically inspired because if Christ could kill, if Christ could be killed by the dragon before he accomplished God's salvation, then Satan would have stopped God's word from happening and won his battle. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, verse five, who was to rule the nations, all the nations, with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to His throne. Then the woman, so this caught up, that's the word rapture or harpazo. Christ, when He went back to the Father, He was raptured up to the Father. We're looking for that to happen to us when He returns. Then the woman fled into the wilderness um, and where she had been pl a place prepared by God so that she would 
the nearest for 1,260 days. That turns out to be three and a half years with 360 day lunar calendar years. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war and they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. This is still future tense. This is the midpoint of that seven year period. And the great dragon was thrown down. The serpent, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the safety, and the power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. His access to the throne that he's had for millennia, and the influence that he has on world events in some degrees from the heavenly vantage point of his authority that he had will have been taken away from him at this point. This is a significant event where the mystery of God is fulfilled as he said according to his prophets where God says that all the kingdoms of the world will have become his kingdom and he will have taken his rule and reign and power and authority and begun to reign at this point. In another sense, this is the brink of the darkest time of human history. And Satan as it says, he'll know he's got a short time. He's going to kick it into overdrive, his activity on earth, to bring about the darkest time in human history and the highest and hottest persecution uh, of any of God's people, meaning that any Jews that are alive at the time or any believers of every nation, any nation that are on the earth at that time. It will all happen at his hand and his, using the, the uh, arm of worldwide, satanically inspired human government to enforce his one world empire, the, the mark of his name being forced or compelled to be received on any hand or right hand or forehead by anybody who would want to be part of his society and want to live. Verse 11 is connected to you and I today as well. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even when faced with death. So this is them, then, and there, but it's also for us because we deal with an accuser day and night. And we will until, all Christians will until this event actually happens or until we go um, and be with him. Uh, some of this is still mysterious, of course. I'm not, I don't live in, in one sense. I don't observe all this stuff that's happening. I just see what the scriptures say, but this is a clear event that's going to happen that's going to affect and send shockwaves and ripples throughout the universe when Satan will be ejected. The, the battle line will be pushed back to earth. And he won't have access to heaven anymore. This has not happened yet, but it will. And it's connected to Christ's death on the cross and resurrection. Because it says, overcoming him is through the blood of the lamb, the sacrifice on the cross, and because of the word of their testimony, our report of who Christ is, their report of who Christ is, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. That's segue into the major martyrdom that will happen. Those who are executed who have true faith in Christ of all people groups at that time. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth. There's that third and final woe, that seventh trumpet. And to the sea, because it's the two domains that Satan has now access to only. No more access to heaven at this point. But woe to the earth and the sea. Because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing he has only a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nursed for a time and times and half a time. Code language again for three and a half years. Time, times, half a time. It's one year, times is two years, half a time is half a year. Add it together, you get three and a half years. And the servant poured out water like water, like a river out of his mouth after the woman. As these the armies he unleashes by his own command on earth after this woman, Israel, national Israel, so that she so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. This water breathing dragon. It's kind of ironic. It's usually fire breathing, right? So the dragon was enraged with the woman 
And if the woman is national Israel, like we've seen, uh, to make war, and he went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So the rest of her children, that might be a reference to um, believers of every nation that will have come to faith in Christ at that point. Because they, you know, like we are today, we are spiritual descendants of Abraham as Christ Christians, even if we're not physically descendants of uh, uh, Shem or, uh, or Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. Okay. Keeping the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus, that indicates they are believers in Christ right there. They have that's that connection. So all the is national Israel that's alive at that point, they will come to faith in Christ and no longer be enemies of Christ, of Christians, and, and in their profession of faith by being against our profession of faith. They will become believers themselves. What's left of them, anyway? What's left of them? And they will see the return of Christ. They'll see the return of Christ and his salvation that he brings, weeping as they see the wounds in his hands. Saying, who gave you these wounds? Remember, he still got the scars. He said, I got them in the house of my friends, according to the prophet. There. So, we will close in prayer. And and thank you uh, for hanging in there. <laughs> All right. And we just remember, Lord, the mystery of God being fulfilled. At this point, the seven, seventh trumpet being sounded, the kingdom of the world becoming the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and you will reign forever and ever you, have, you will have taken your great power and will have begun to reign at this point. The shock waves that will ripple through the universe will come from your uh, ejecting Satan and his angels from uh, accusing the brethren before the throne in heaven at that point and um, Lord we just pray you please strengthen our faith in this. We read about this point in history, the brink of the darkest period of human history, um, and we see that you are sovereign and that our victory in you is centered um, on you dealing decisively with the dragon and banning him from demonic heavenly influence. And Lord, even as though the dragon will be will persecute heavenly Jewish and and Gentile believers alive at that time, even to widespread death and martyrdom. The second beatitude rings true in, in Revelation. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, and their works will follow with them. And Lord, we thank you for the victory that we have in you, in the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I pray you please help us to overcome the accuser that we have to deal with in the heavenly places. Help us to fight the good fight of faith with all the armor of God, Lord, and to stand in the evil day when we wrestle against him and the accusations. Help us to stand by your word and by your blood and by the testimony. Help us not to love our lives um, unto the death we pray. You use our lives and bring, um, make us alive in the spirit, we pray, through any suffering or death we have to go through in this life. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's all stand and we'll turn to hymn number 569. 569, we'll sing uh, one verse. And be dismissed.
Man, we close in prayer. Father God, just thank you so much. All that you've done for us. Thank you again as we do. Thank you to Jesus, your son, who died upon that cross for sin. Thank you for this message this morning. Thank you so much for the book of Revelation. Thank you so much for Eric being here with us and revealing some of these things to us. And we do pray, Lord, that we can learn from your word. And I do pray again that you, I think of